Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, a place to find connection and a sense of belonging, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we talk about sensitivity and the richness that it adds, the strengths we have because of our sensitivity, and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there, it's Patricia. If you are listening in real time, I talked about taking a month break where I'm not going to be releasing any new episodes. From June 18th through July 9th, I'm going to be replaying the most popular episodes that have been released so far. So I'm taking a break so I can get refreshed replenish. I'm going to be heading to a one week long silent retreat at a monastery uh, at the end of the month. So when I come back, I'm sure I'll have an episode or two to talk about with you then. I just want to let you know how much I appreciate you. Thank you for all the feedback and support that you've given me. I just really feel blessed to be here to be of service to you. The next new episode will come out on July 16th, but I think that you really enjoy a replay of these other episodes. All right, here we go. In this episode, Annie Schusler is joining us. Annie and I had a great talk. I actually had been on her podcast a year ago in November. We had fun just talking about the surprises that come up when you podcast and how as as an introvert, she's been able to have these really deep conversations with people. We talked about her being called a crybaby when she was young and how she would respond today to that person that had called her a crybaby. We also talk about creating an environment that works for an HSP and with the HSPs that she works with, how important validation is for HSPs to hear that we do better when we've got a work schedule that accommodates our needs and downtime and time for self-care. We talk about what I call the proper care and feeding of the HSP. We also had a great conversation about play. I think you're really gonna enjoy this episode. The other thing is one of my fears going into this was that I would do a recording of an interview and either I wouldn't press record or something would happen to the interview. We did this amazing interview and then when we were done, it looked like it hadn't recorded. I thought I'd be devastated, but we actually had this conversation and I said, yay. So one of my worst fears just happened and I lived through it. And Annie was great. She said, if we need to record another episode, we'll just schedule it and do it. I was really hoping to release this episode early on because it was such a great interview and I wouldn't know until we actually got off of Zoom to see if it had recorded. It looks like it actually did record it, so we're good to go. And it was so nice for me to see the resilience. I think in the past, honestly, I probably would have been so devastated and disappointed that I wouldn't have even been able to process the end of the call with her because I just would have felt like I failed and it would be like asking too much. And the truth is, it is so nice to see that we've got this neuroplasticity in our brains and how we look at things really can change things. And my energy level stayed the same. Hey, Annie, welcome. Thank you, Patricia. It's really good to be here. I am so happy that you're here. I could do a little happy dance right now. (laughs) So do you identify as an HSP? Absolutely. Yes. Yep. (laughs) When did you learn you were an HSP? I think as soon as I heard the words highly sensitive person, it really, I think I knew right then. And then I took the quiz (laughs) and I was like, oh yes, that is absolutely me. Um, And so I think it was um, somewhere in the time when I was also learning to be a therapist that I was exposed okay. to this. Yeah. That's kind of a nice time to learn, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I didn't find out till way, way, way after. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think of the term highly sensitive person? Well, I really like it, but um, I, I, because it resonates so much with me, but um, I think it can be difficult because the word sensitive can be perceived to mean something like fragile. And I don't think of it that way, but, um, but it can be seen as kind of a negative. Yeah. 
It's really interesting when I ask people this question, like I get that sensitivity or sensitive has a very negative connotation and culturally it's not positive. Mm -hmm. I just don't have a buzz around it and I don't see it as being fragile. So it's really interesting to see how people perceive it. Yeah. Is there another term that you wish were used instead of highly sensitive? I mean, no, I like highly sensitive, but I guess, I guess it could also be like highly perceptive or highly tuned in, you know, that maybe we could, we could just use a bunch of different words to describe it. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about being an HSP? I love it. I mean, I love me and it's just (laughs) absolutely part of me, but I would say that that wasn't always the case. Like before I knew about being an HSP, before I knew those terms, before I was an adult, I would say, it was painful and it was, you know, kind of a mismatch for my family where um, I would say that I am the only HSP in my original family. And so it was, you know, it was painful and it was seen as basically too sensitive, you know, within my family. And then also in, you know, in the school, I I was called a crybaby a lot. And yeah, so it was a real bummer in those spaces. Yeah. Yeah, but now I really like it. And now I feel like it's a lens for me to understand certain things and to give myself room to uh, create the environment that's going to work for me and to be able to tune in to other people. My wife is an HSP. One of my kids is an HSP. Um, and so it helps me understand them in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How is it for your non-HSP? So you're a family of four. Yeah. And three of you are HSPs and one's not an HSP. So how's that? I mean, so the one who is not an HSP, he is very sensitive in, you know, in the emotional way. Like he is really highly empathetic and he tunes into what other people need. So it's It's okay. I mean, I think the part that's probably a bummer for him is that um, the rest of us can be kind of like sensitive to noise when he's not as sensitive to noise. And so, you know, he would probably like it if things could be a little bit louder sometimes. (laughs) And he has just a higher capacity for like being out there in the world all day. And so Mm -hmm. um, that might sometimes be a bummer for him that we're not like out and socializing more. But then he also does get those opportunities like at school and and with other people. Got it. Yeah. So can you tell the listeners a little bit about the work that you do and how that relates to work with HSPs that you do? Yeah. So I am, so I'm a therapist one day a week. So I am a therapist. And then the rest of the time, my, um, my business is business coaching for people who are trained as therapists. And so in both of those realms, I work with a lot of HSPs and we don't necessarily always talk about them being HSPs, but I just notice that a ton. And so I would say with the people who I work with on their businesses, a lot of them are HSPs. And I think that they're probably drawn to me because they sense that in me too even if they're not using those words or those concepts. And a lot of, so a lot of the people who I'm working with on their businesses, we right away need to be looking at like, what are your hours? What are your self-care routines? What are, what is working for you and what is draining your energy? And so I talk about that a lot and the HSPs I work with get it right away. Like, oh yeah. This is my, these are my limits. This is what I need to really be able to thrive. And usually I'll hear from people that until we started talking about those things that they kind of thought they were supposed to be able to thrive working a lot more hours. And they, they thought that they were supposed to have a business that looked a certain way that doesn't actually work for them. And so they were feeling like they're doing it wrong or there's something wrong with them that they're not thriving under maybe circumstances that some other people can thrive under. 
My guess is that when you start talking about it, they probably feel pretty validated and Mm -hmm. supported and that there's nothing wrong with them because if we don't know we're an HSP, we just look at the 70% of everybody else and can't figure out why the heck we can't do what they do. Yeah. I mean, what's your experience? I think that's true. And then even like that, that 70%, a lot of times what we're seeing is what people are putting out there (laughs) on social media. So it gets even worse because we're comparing right. what's true for us to what someone else is curating you know, rather than what they're actually living. But yeah, I think people do feel validated by even just me saying like, oh yeah, I never thrived doing 20 to 25 sessions a week. That never worked for me. That self-disclosure can really quickly cut through the shame and the feeling of like, I have to find a way that this is going to work for me. And it also allows us really quickly to get creative. So if we know these are the constraints, these are the hours that are going to work for you, this is the kind of work that's going to really help you thrive, then we've got those constraints and we can start getting creative about how to make a business work. Mm -hmm. This is a little tangential, but it's been on my mind. So let's see where this takes us. I hear from a lot of people that are not therapists and not entrepreneurs who are in jobs that just drain them and are overwhelming Mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. And I always feel really stuck because I I don't know how to respond because when you're working 40 hours a week and you don't have control over all that stuff, do you have any feedback about what you would say to somebody who is an HSP in an environment that you just know is not working and they really don't have the luxury to be an entrepreneur to get another job? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in my therapy practice, I definitely work with a lot of folks who are in that circumstance. And I think that the validating is a big deal. Like you said before, I think even just validating, yeah, that sounds pretty hellish. That sounds really hard is, is validating if we can come at their situation from that place of, yes, that's really not optimal for you or for a lot of people that just takes this burden off. And then the other, I don't have any advice for them of like, you know, here's what you got to do. But I do encourage them to look for ways to make room for themselves, like to look for ways to have, you know, for some people it's having more quiet built into their day somewhere. And for some people it's about having, really allowing themselves to have downtime outside of work and to let go of the shoulds of what they should be doing when they're not at work. And so those things can begin to help. Yeah. When I worked for um, a big organization that, well, I worked for a big organization, I often would go into the bathroom, into the stall Mm -hmm. and just either stand and really have both feet firmly grounded and kind of imagine roots going down from my feet into the earth and stand up Mm -hmm. really tall and kind of feel a connection going upwards and take some time to breathe because it just was chaotic and busy and it really wasn't always well suited for my little HSP-ness. Yeah. And so, yeah. And I think this is really a social justice issue too, where there are a lot of jobs out there and I'm not just talking like in tech or in, you know, corporate and management. I'm, I'm talking about like if you're working for Amazon in a fulfillment center, I know you don't get to have very much control over your working conditions at all and that there's you know there's a real problem that 40 hours isn't how much most people are supposed to be working like it's not really it's too much it's too much for so many of us and then for hsps even more so yeah yeah i know i feel so lucky that i get to be an entrepreneur that i get to set my own hours and take care of myself. It's, it wasn't always like that, but it feels so lucky. I'm so with you. I, I don't, my guess is it's a combination of age and lifestyle Mm -hmm. that I love being able to set my own hours to have the people around me that I love to have around me and to just not have to deal with a lot of the nonsense that you have to, when you're not your own boss and you really can't choose who your coworkers are. You can't choose who your boss is. You can't choose who your customers or clients are. Mm -hmm. That, that can be really hard for an HSP. Yeah. 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 So 
I know you work with a lot of HSPs. Can you tell me about, we, we've t- touched on this a little bit, but what are some of the common themes or fears or beliefs that you see with the HSPs that you work with? And then maybe talk about some of their perceived weaknesses and how you help them turn those into superpowers. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So themes would definitely be that, um, you know, someone comes to me and they're saying, why can't I, you know, work in this particular way? Why can't I see 25 clients a week? And, you know, why can't I do what the person down the hall is doing? Whatever it is, it's, it's a really common theme of comparison and always seeing themselves as less than and as you know, not being able to accomplish as much. And being afraid that that's going to mean that they're never going to make enough money. Like feeling like I'm, I'm never going to catch up. I'm always going to be behind. I'm always going to be just kind of barely surviving. And I think there's a pivotal moment that happens for a lot of people I work with where they start to see, and this again, this is lucky for entrepreneurs because we get to decide how we run our businesses there's a kind of a pivotal empowerment moment where they see, oh, I could do this differently. I actually am the boss here. I get to set this up the way that I want to. And so that's like a time where their beliefs start to shift in a really fundamental way. Yeah. It's yeah. exciting when that happens. And I guess, so some examples of where something looked like it was a weakness, and then they see it as a strength. One thing is really just kind of an obvious one is if you're an HSP and you understand what it means to be an HSP, then that makes you really excellent at understanding other HSPs. It, it makes you, and especially if you're a therapist, which is what you know the people I'm working with do, it means that you're able to kind of speak the language of what's going on for other HSPs. And I think it also, I mean, I don't think we have a monopoly on empathy or on attunement, but I think HSPs tend to be really good at those things. And so when we can tap into that, rather than seeing ourselves as too sensitive, seeing ourselves as really highly attuned, that that becomes a superpower. Yeah. And it's so easy. So many of us have received negative messaging and then we Mm -hmm. continue to have that negative messaging. My friend and I talk about, because I always felt like I was bugging her. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I'm sorry, I'm being so needy. And and she encouraged me to reframe that. So when I'm having that feeling, Mm -hmm. I go, I love connecting. Connecting is really important to me. And even though you can kind of hear a little bit of humor in my voice, it's a way of embracing that Mm -hmm. vulnerability that that I feel and using some language that serves me better than the negative narrative from my history. Yes. Yeah. Instead of like, I'm being so sensitive, like I'm really tuning in. Like I'm taking a class right now um, that I'm really enjoying it, but I'm taking a class online and in some of the group calls, there will be um, just like rattling happening in the background. And um, it really bugs the hell out of me. Like it's really hard for me to listen and stay present while there's all this like static and rattling going on. And I now think of that as kind of a a superpower because when I'm running my own groups, I'm really paying attention to what's happening in the environment here. What's, you know, what's going on with noise, what's going on with all of my senses. And then I think that makes me really better equipped to create a calm experience for people where they can be present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we definitely tune into the lights, the temperature, the sound, all of those things that people are comfortable, if they're shifting, if they look like they're uncomfortable, that we really pick up on those things. So we're very tuned into what people need and often being able to anticipate people's needs. Yeah. I know my sister has, she's my best friend. My sister has said, you always seem to realize when, when there's a noise going on that we need to like, you know, we need to turn off the radio or something. And whenever you do that, it all of a sudden is like, Oh, that's better, but I didn't notice it. 
And I'm like, oh, I, would, I was noticing it the whole time. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I still have a couple of mobile clients, but there are a number that always have the TV on when I get there and it is so bloody loud. Yeah. And every single time I'm like, would you mind if we just turn that down? Because I'm going to be really distracted and I'm going to be watching TV. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> how yeah. can I tell them? It's assaulting my ears and I, I, it's just really hard for me to listen. They're always, they always are surprised like, oh, of course. And they turn it off. But mm -hmm. it's the same thing every week. And I go and I just feel, I feel assaulted. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you about something that you said earlier, and we didn't talk about discussing this, so feel free to not answer and we'll just edit this out. Yeah. So what I heard you say is that you work with folks that you think are highly sensitive, but you don't really bring that to their attention. You just work within the scope of what you're working with. Can you talk a little bit about why that is? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's probably that it seems so obvious to me and then I think it's like the water that we're swimming in that I'm not, I'm not thinking to mention it. And it probably would be useful for me to bring it up more often. Interesting. Yeah. Like I just think of it as like, yeah, oh yeah, I see. I'm in my head. I'm thinking, oh yeah, you're an HSP. Well, most people I work with are. Yeah, that makes sense. But it would probably be helpful for me to go ahead and name that and check it out and see if they agree. I guess since I'm so passionate about providing education and once I found out it was just a game changer that I think having a framework to understand how and why we function in the world the way that we do can be mm -hmm. so powerful. It's not that I'm into the label and are you or aren't you, mm -hmm. but just having a framework can just feel so validating. What I find with the HSP clients that I have is that experience of you're not alone, you're not the only one because we kind of live in our heads and we look at everybody else and it looks like everybody else is having a very different experience in the world and we can't figure out why we're not having that same experience. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Like I know uh, some of my clients, we talk openly about them being HSPs and it is useful. A client who has been doing amazing things, her name's April Harder and in the beginning, we both talked about being HSPs and we both saw that we were in an HSP Facebook group together. And it really, it gave us a framework to look at her business from the very beginning in terms of like her constraints were really clear of, I want to be doing public facing service oriented stuff only three days a week. And so we're just going to go from there. And that it just gives us so much freedom of, okay, let's build an amazing business within those constraints. And let's look at what that means. So, you know, getting to completely skip over any of the should or what about other people are able to do this or that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Where would you like to go? What would you like to talk about that's on your heart that you feel is important? I mean, I think one thing is how when I go into a situation now, I am able, like if I go into a situation where I'm away from home, let's say, I'm really able to think about my HSP needs and I'm able to give myself room in a way that really helps me get the most out of life. And can you give an example of what some of those HSP needs are? Yeah. So if I go on a retreat, I need a single room. Like I love people, but I'm not going to do well if I have a roommate mm -hmm. during a retreat because I need that time to just be by myself, decompress, like slow down, let my heart rate go down and recharge. And that's like where I think being an introvert and an HSP intersect for me. And I also need to respect my physical needs. I think we all do, but like, I really need to respect my physical needs around sleep and around food and around movement, like letting myself get up and stretch when I need to, even if stretching isn't what everyone's doing. And, you know, respect, this is the kind of food I need to bring because it's going to help me stay balanced. I've got to like be drinking water. I mean, kind of boring stuff that we know we're supposed to do, 
but really giving myself room to take up that space and ask for it and advocate for it. I affectionately call it the proper care and feeding of the HSP. Yes. Because yes. it's really important that because our nervous systems are so finely tuned, we need those things to function on a daily basis. And it, there are kind of two things that if you look at people that are non-HSPs and how they can run on empty for a really long time, but is that really mm -hmm. a good thing? Is it a healthy thing? Is it adaptive or maladaptive? And it's not really for me to say, but for HSPs, we just don't have that wiggle room and that luxury if we want to be functioning at our optimum. Yeah, maybe it's a good thing for us. You know, I mean, as a 46 year old woman, like maybe it's a good thing for me that I've already figured out that there, there are certain things I need to do to care for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe that's making me healthier. I mean, I have so many things that I, I don't even, I don't even think about what it would be like not to do these things, but I have like there are certain days of the week that I don't have any appointments and I just need that. And it, it really, I'll, I'll do work on those days, but I won't have any appointments. I have like certain hours where I do self care, certain hours where I'm just going to be like in retreat in the day. I have like three weeks where I will like for three weeks in a row, I'll do my regular work schedule and then I'll do one week where I'm much more pulled back. So it's not like a vacation week, but it's a much more pulled back week. And so all of these things that I'm allowing myself, they just mean that I don't, I don't have to go through very much of my life feeling kind of like exhausted or feeling frazzled. Mm -hmm. I had a client recently talk about the Sunday night scaries, and I'd never heard that term before. Have you heard that yes. before? No, but that resonates. I always thought of it as like Sunday night yeah. doom, but yeah. <laughs> and I can remember when I didn't have control over my schedule, that feeling of it's like almost getting a knot in the pit of my stomach and my throat closes up, feeling like yes. the world, like I'm going to get on this roller coaster that starts on Monday and I can't get off till Friday and I have no control. And I remember just that dread of it's just too much and there's no time and there's no place for me and feeling really trapped. Totally trapped, like um, like I couldn't mm -hmm. breathe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the other thing I was thinking about last night that I would just love to ask you about, I have a theory. Mm -hmm. It's so funny. So the chatter mm -hmm. in my head, my gremlins are saying, you're going to say this and Annie's going to go like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> 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 and if you do, I'm okay with that. I yeah. think that there's something that has to do with the way that we plan and forecast and we really think about things. But it's almost like there's this thing with the halfway mark that I'm really having a hard time articulating it. Let me give you a tangible. This is the easiest thing mm -hmm. for me to do. So I'm just getting mm -hmm. ready to submit the beginning episodes of the podcast to, you know, wherever they need to go so that you guys are hearing them. By now, of course, you're already hearing them. But all of the steps up until now have felt like each one is just a huge hurdle. And it felt really intimidating. But as I, as I tackled each one, it really built my confidence and ease at whatever the next one was. So that skill building, which I think is really important. Now I'm finding that there's a new gremlin. And this is kind of the halfway mark. So it's like I've gotten to the point where I'm just about ready to submit the podcast. But now I'm having fear of, you know, what happens next and I can remember going on trips and feeling like coming home was always the hardest or, you know, like that halfway mark of wanting to get past it because I didn't think that I could do the second half, this anticipation that I'm not going to be able to do things. As I'm talking, what I'm wondering is if it's not about having so much overwhelm and overstimulation before I knew I was an HSP and that feeling of mm. things just being too much and not understanding what that was and I've, I've talked about this before that I thought I had social anxiety for most of my life. And now that I know that I'm an HSP, I think early on, I got so overwhelmed and overstimulated. I just didn't want to show up. And had I known what it was, I would have been able to figure it out. And so I'm almost wondering if that's the same mm -hmm. thing with this. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I know I've been kind of rambling. 
Interesting. So something about like that halfway point being a place of, say it again, it's a place where you get to where you feel like there's going to be some relief. No, it's like a fear that it's going to be harder, that like there's always ah. something harder coming. And and I can remember graduating from elementary school and thinking, well, middle school is like, that's when it's going to get really hard. Like I've had it easy. And then from middle school thinking, it's going to get really hard in high school. And then high school thinking, you know, college is when it's going to get really hard and thinking, Grat, like I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to have the skills so it's like it's a very fearful mm. anticipation of what's to come next, which I joke about kind of the function of anxiety. If only it was, you know, the first thought that popped in my head is, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to get my needs met and it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> Usually not really the first thought that pops in my head. Yeah, no, yeah. me neither. Me neither. I mean, I think, I think I relate to this. And one thing that comes up for me is like, as soon as I've accomplished something that seemed like it was going to be really hard, I, what I want to have happen is that then I feel like, great, I arrived. I did it. I thought this was something that was going to be so hard and it was, but I got through it and I'm here, but I don't end up spending very much time there in like, okay, I've accomplished something. I can relax for a minute. Like I usually am now in a new realm. So like before I had a podcast, I thought getting my podcast out there, that was going to be kind of like the arrival point. Like, oh, I will have done that. And it was for like a second, but then it was now the realm I'm in is of podcasters. So now it's a given that you have a podcast. And so now it's about like, given that without like letting yourself be marinating in it for a second, like what's the next thing that you're supposed to do? Or like, what's the next accomplishment to get stressed out about? Mm -hmm. So for me, like that's a habit of mind that is very painful. And I'm sure it will just keep happening. Like I would like to write a book and I'm sure I will. But as soon as I do that, my new realm is going to be the realm of authors, mm -hmm. right? So then whatever I hadn't been thinking of as my realm before, it's going to become like a new standard and a new set of expectations. So I really have to have a sense of humor about that. I really have to like get grounded and keep things in perspective around that. But that's definitely like one of my mind habits. Yeah. It's almost like there's a new normal that we leave the old and we start mm -hmm. a new and then the whole new has a whole new set of challenges and joys and everything like that. Yeah. And like expectations and comparisons if you let them happen. Yeah. yeah. So the gremlins in my head are saying, I shouldn't have talked about what I did because it wasn't a very well-formed thought and it really didn't feel very interesting once we were done. So I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you listeners that hung in there, it's going to get a little bit more interesting now. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions I'd love to ask you before we wrap up. Is that okay? All of right. course. What are the challenges that you experience as an HSP? And then maybe we can talk about the corresponding strengths. Hmm, the challenges I experience, um, I would say... One of the biggest ones is when I'm going to do something new, like in the last year I went on a business retreat that was like a four day in-person business retreat. I hosted a three day business wow. retreat and I went on a silent retreat for three days. And for each of those, I was really nervous about like, what is this going to be like? What is my energy going to be like? what is going to be like draining or impossible about these situations? Like, am I going to have to have a roommate? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of thing. And, um, and I didn't have to have a roommate in any of the situations. I was able to, you know, work that out. So that was the first question is like, what are the, what are the fears or what are the hard parts? So the challenges that you experience. Challenges. Yeah, that would is be Is it anticipating one. new situations? Mm -hmm. How's it going to fit with your needs? Anticipating new situations where I have less mm -hmm. control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what do you see as the corresponding strength? 
corresponding strength, I think is now as a 46 year old person and, you know, being, you know, with my personal story, like being a mom, being queer, being like having kind of gone through all of these different things where I've had to advocate for Mm -hmm. myself, I think is that, that I can advocate for myself and that I can set things up in a way that's going to make me healthier and help me thrive better. And doing that actually, it helps me, but it also potentially helps other people like making room and saying, oh, you know, not in an entitled jerky way, but in like a thoughtful way saying like, oh, I'm going to need this and, and let me, you know, take responsibility and prepare for how things are going to need to be for me. I don't see that as being a jerky way at all, that really you're modeling self-care. And I think as moms, we're taught Mm -hmm. to be selfless and to sacrifice and to give, give, give to become crabby, resentful parents where we model to our kids how not to take care of things as opposed to modeling really (laughs) good self-care. Yeah. 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 My my sons, they're 18 now, but sometimes they'll ask me something and then they'll Mm. say like, you can say no after it. And, and I've told uh-huh. them, like, it makes me feel really bad when they say that, because to me, I see that as a reflection of me not being clear with boundaries where they feel like they have to take care of me instead of just asking. Mm. Um, mm. I think I'm reading more into it. And when I've told them that, they just think they're being polite. But I really wonder because I did have a hard time setting clear limits. And I know that as a mom, there were times when I said, like, <sighs> okay. You know, that the message that I got is yes, but what you're asking me is a huge burden because I didn't have the ability to set clear, firm limits with them. Mm. And now you do. I mean, one thing though that I hear in that is, I don't know if they're HSPs or either of them is, but like in them saying, you can say no, I'm thinking, well, that's really nice. There are these two young men who really are into consent and who are really paying attention and and wanting a real yes. That's a great reframe. You know. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> they really are turning out to be delightful young men. They, we sent them off to college this summer, and each of them has come home since then. Oh. And I'm just like, my heart just swells. Like, they're just turning into these lovely young men. Yeah, and that's really saying something, yeah. right? I have two boys also, and, like, that's, you know, we're living in a time when – men and boys are going to have to like step Mm -hmm. up and do better. So that's awesome. What do you do for play? Well, (laughs) I've been really embracing my nerd self lately and I've been playing, do you know Settlers of Catan? I don't. What is that? Game. So it's like a card game and it's a game where you, um, you're like collecting resources and, you're trying to like build settlements. It actually, it's, it's very like the, the metaphor is very colonizer, which is a bummer, but um, it's basically a nerdy card game that my wife and I have been playing like every night (laughs) for the last six months. So I literally love to play games like board games, ping pong. Like we have a ping pong table in the backyard. um, And like, I'm always trying to get my kids to play games with me. I wasn't so much into imaginary play with them. Like I'm not, um, I'm not a fun, fun mom in terms of like playing at the playground or playing hide I'm and seek. I'm not either. <laughs> yeah, my wife totally is, but I'm not. But now that we're in the realm of like playing board games and and ping pong and things like that, um, I love it. So that's probably my most, like that's the thing I do the most to play. And then the other thing I find that I really need is to have some friends who I can just like laugh and be super goofy with and just like go all the way into full goofy mode. Mm. And how do you, uh, sorry, this is like my tasky brain. I feel like I miss the social cues of responding. I need to go back and ask you how to spell Catan. Oh, it's a C-A-T-A-N. And it's settlers, like settling a new colony. Settlers. Okay. All right. Yeah. That will be in the show notes spelled correctly, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Having time with friends to connect is so important, at least for me. 
Yeah. It's interesting. The reason why I asked this question is because I thought that play was really hard for me. And what I'm finding is there are lots of ways that I love to play, but couldn't find people to play. And so I abandoned all those things and then looked to all of the extroverts and feel like that doesn't feel like play to me. And so I feel like I don't play and I'm not good at it. But every time I ask this to someone, I'm like, I love board games. I love card games. Well, yeah, what, what kinds of things did you do that you thought weren't the right way to play? Well, I look at, you know, people like to go out dancing into clubs, into bars, into concerts. And like, uh, that is just not yeah. my idea of a good time. Yeah, like yeah. partying. Yeah. yeah, because no, yeah. nobody posts on Facebook like, I stayed home tonight and I read a book in my pajamas. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Or nobody, I mean, I guess it, it's nerdy to say like, yeah, like we stayed up really late playing Catan. It was so cool. Like, but yeah, that's a raging good time right. now. And I, <laughs> I think that I... Because I couldn't find playmates, I just stopped doing mm. those things. And I don't think that I even recognized, yeah. like, this is what gives me joy. This is what's fun. And I didn't fight for it. Nobody wanted to play. Mm. And so I just stopped doing it and then ended up being pretty unfulfilled. So this is, I love that mm. I asked this question. I love having a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It is it fun, is. isn't it? it it's amazing to have a platform. I've just gotten so curious. And every time I read something or see something, I'm like, oh, I want to talk to that person about this thing. It is so exciting. Oh, it's so great. Yeah. I think another way I play now that you put it that way, where it's just like open-ended is um, I really, I really like my podcast and I like my job in that sometimes if I'm starting to feel a little bit anxious about like, oh, I have to work today. I'm, I'm running a, a group or I'm, you know, I have some sessions. Then I'll think, well, if you could do anything, what would you feel like doing? And a lot of time it's like, I would want to get together with a really smart person and talk about business. Oh, you get to do that today, all day. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and then, yeah. So then I can bring my playful, nerdy self instead of like just feeling anxious. Yeah. I think I want to digress for a minute. Yeah. Because really, I think I'm going to cut out that earlier stuff that we <laughs> that we had. Okay. So can yeah. we talk a little bit about podcasting? And then maybe what I'll do is yeah. that's some better content. So I'm going to just pause and then start a conversation yeah. with you. Are you okay with that? Sure. So Annie, you have a podcast. I would love to hear about what your experience has been as a podcaster what are some things you didn't expect? What are some of the gifts and joys? I know that's kind of a lot of questions at one time. Absolutely. Yeah. So I love podcasting. I love that, you know, creating my podcast has meant that I, I have full creative control. Like I get to decide what the focus is. I get to invite people and, and then like, frame the questions. It just feels like such an honor to get to do that. And then what I didn't, so I, I expected that, like I expected this is going to be creative and it's going to be interesting and I'll get to take it where I want to go. But what I didn't expect was like, whenever I interview someone, I feel really bonded to them mm. and I feel like they're my friend, even though it's often like the only time I talk to that person. And in a sense, they're not my friend <laughs> because that's the only time I'm talking to them. But we really have a conversation where I get to learn about them and I get to be with them. And as an introvert, I wouldn't be having those conversations otherwise. Like I, I would be having some of them, but not nearly as many because I'm doing a weekly podcast where almost every single week I'm interviewing a different person. And I was just not that much of an extrovert that I would be, you know, talking to 50 new people a year. So that's really enriched my life. And because it's a format of like my, my podcast is about a half hour long. It's an amount of time that I can really handle and thrive in and still feel energized afterward. There's like no small talk involved pretty much. It's just 
like I'm going to ask you about the things that I want to know about and that I know my audience wants to know about. So I just didn't expect it to be so awesome. Mm. Annie's, <laughs> I'm just drawing a blank. <laughs> about Therapist yes. Clubhouse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remembered your name this time. Annie's <laughs> podcast is called Therapist Clubhouse. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the podcast is about? And then I want to comment about what you said. Okay, yeah. So it is a podcast where I talk to people who are trained as therapists about their businesses. And so what has it been like for them to become entrepreneurs? How do they feel about money? How do they feel about making money? How have they formed and changed their businesses over time? And how has being an entrepreneur kind of allowed them to live their values and be a leader in the way that they want to be a leader. So it, it gets to go into really deep places sometimes about mindset. And it also gets to go into really nuts and bolts stuff about like what worked and what didn't mm -hmm. work. And those are the things I mm -hmm. love. And you had said, you know, I'm not friends with these people, but I have a reframe for that, that you're having mm -hmm. an intimate conversation with someone and you are yeah. so present with your guests that you know, I don't know what we want to do about the label friendship, but you're having an intimate connection mm -hmm. with someone. And whether you, yeah. you know, talk to them every week or send them Christmas cards or, you know, whatever defines friendship, that time that you have is, it's meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I was listening to your podcast this morning. It, it came out and I was curious to listen to the most recent episode. And I was thinking, you really have such a beautiful presence with people and not only is just the tone of your voice, but how you show up for people. It's just really captivating. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And then I had the, I had the blessing of being able to be a guest on your podcast and I just felt that presence and connection with you and we hadn't connected before and then we had a chance right. to see each other to retreat this summer. And then it feels like it's a nice full circle moment to be able to have you on as a guest. Absolutely. It's really cool. Yeah. And I totally remember our interview on my podcast. And I remember, um, I don't know how much we talked about it before we started recording the HSP connection, but like, I remember you holding like, you know, I'm going to need a second before we start recording. And, and that felt so good to me. I remember this, like, all right, let's actually be here. Let's really be present together. Yeah. I think I even asked if when we were done, could we take a few minutes and talk about the interview? Because what goes on for me is then I end up in my head for the next couple of days, ruminating and having a negative conversation. So for me to just have a conversation when we were done to just wrap it up. Mm -hmm. And I've done that with guests when they've been on, I don't know if they have the need for that sense of closure and processing, but it really meant so much that you were able to honor that for me. And then for me, it was done. We talked about it. I got some feedback and then I could move on because how many times as HSPs have we left a situation and we think about it for days and we usually don't think about it in a positive way. Damn, that's <laughs> so true. Yeah. And you're the only person who's asked for that explicitly. And I think it's brilliant. Oh, thanks. That's yeah. self-care. Yeah. And I do think a lot of people do the ruminating afterward. Absolutely. I know oh, yeah. I that coulda, shoulda, woulda. Why didn't I say this? I should have said that. Mm -hmm. Why didn't... In fact, I just did an interview when I was in the shower this morning having regrets over something that I said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some pretty bad regrets. So can we do can we do a debrief after I this I was interview? planning on doing it. I would love that. <laughs> God, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My head's going a couple different places. The other thing I wanted to address is, as an introvert, I think podcasting can be so powerful because I've been saying this to friends recently that I saw something on a thread that really touched my heart. And I reached out to the person that posted mm -hmm. it and asked if we could do a Zoom call. It basically was an interview to see you know, if this person would be a good fit for the podcast. I, I kind of cried when we talked because I was so touched by what this person said and this person is gonna be on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it gives me a platform to reach out and talk to people. We're like, what do I do? Hi, I saw your post. Do you want to be my friend? Right. <laughs> 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 I, 
I mean, I think for some introverts that does happen that way really naturally where they, you know, would then reach out and then have a chat and then it keeps going. Um, and I think for me, and it sounds like for you, like this is a really great vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. For that. Well, and it's yeah. interesting with the same person that a colleague of mine reached out to this person to just say that they really liked the comment that was on the thread and the person said, thank you. So, you know, it doesn't always open up a dialogue for whatever right. reason. And it, there's not a right or a wrong. But I really do think mm -hmm. that there is something that's really exciting about I'm just getting curious about all kinds of things now. And every time I'm reading something or I see something I'm like, oh, I want to talk to that person. Yeah, I think too, you were asking like, what is surprising? I think one thing that shocked the hell of me was when people started approaching me after the podcast had been out for a while and say like, oh, I feel like I know you and like mentioning things about me that they knew because they had been listening to the podcast. And I was like, what? Like that really really surprised me. And it was really lovely. So it didn't feel creepy. It felt like a neat thing. No, because I listen to podcasts. I mean, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I feel like the people I'm listening to, I feel connected to them and like I know them. So no, it totally makes yeah. sense to me. I have that too. I feel like I know these people. They're in my ears. And they say that, especially yeah. with podcasting, since we mostly listen with earbuds, or as my husband calls them, earbugs. <laughs> <laughs> That, yeah. you know, these people are literally in our ears and we do feel like we have these intimate relationships with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else about podcasting that surprised you that you want to talk about? And then we'll answer some questions. I guess one more thing is I can really geek out about this is like, I didn't expect that podcasting would stay fun for so long. And because um, it's been like a year and a half or more than a year and a half now. And um, it's still really fun. And that that hasn't always been true for me with other kinds of content. So I used to blog and I, I wrote a blog article every week. And that thing was sometimes really a pain in the ass. Like so often I did not feel like writing and I had to push to, you know, to get something out. And so I didn't expect that podcasting would feel so mm -hmm. different. I had a day last week where I overbooked and had too many interviews and too many things going on. So now I know what I need to schedule. But the nice thing was I thought I can show up and have a conversation. Like it's different than having to yes. use brain power to write a blog or to be with a client. Like I can show up and talk to somebody. I do that pretty well. Yeah. And I'll probably just from, I know this is your podcast, but just from this conversation, I'll probably have a whole bunch of ideas that I wouldn't have had if I hadn't talked well, like to what? you. Well, thinking about like how does, just what we're talking about right now, like thinking about how does being an HSP intersect with being a podcaster and like, is it particularly a good vehicle for HSPs? That kind I think of thing. it is. I think so it's too. One of the reasons yeah. why I love social media because I have such a strong need for connection and I can jump in and get my connection, but it's not like I'm with somebody. And then, you know, when you get that thing of like, okay, I'm done. Like it, sometimes it just like, boom, all of a sudden I'm done. And you can't really do that when you're with people, unless they're good friends that know you like social media, yeah. I'm done. I walk away podcasting. The interview's done. I switch gears. And I know yeah. a lot of podcasters are introverts and because we're deep thinkers, at least the HSP introverts, we're deep thinkers. So we're always thinking about things. I think that we have the ability to really ask interesting questions because we're thinking about them. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 We're, we're just like ready to do that. We might not be ready. I don't know about you, but like, we might not be ready for small talk, but we're like ready to go mm -hmm. deep. Mm hmm. Can you imagine a podcast called like the small talk happy hour? <laughs> <laughs> How banal would that be for us HSPs? <laughs> yeah. I'm done with that one. <laughs> yeah, that is another another thing that I've definitely had uh, mentioned to me as a, a weakness or an annoying quality that I think is a strength <laughs> that I know some people experience as a strength is like getting mm -hmm. too intense, like asking deep questions when someone 
would rather not be asked deep questions. And that doesn't, I, I do want consent. Like I don't want to be pushing through people's boundaries, but um, over time, I think that my tendency to ask intense things ends up meaning that I spend time with people who also want to mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, th- I think I got it together after I sent you the initial invite as I'm getting my systems in place. Now I have a mm-hmm. obnoxiously long two-page thing that I send to all the guests. But part of it says, like, I tend to go pretty deep pretty quickly. And it's right. not my intention to ask anything that you don't want to talk about or makes you feel uncomfortable. So if I ask, you know, you don't have to answer. We can edit it out. But I remember being at a retreat with HSPs and saying, asking an HSP a question, and she's like, "Woo, you go deep fast. I had no idea. You know, like, I'm I'm just showing mm-hmm. up being my intense self. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I've gotten it from relatives, you know, like family reunions and things, like where I just think this is an interesting conversation. We're finally having a, a real exchange. And they're like, whoa. Aunt Bessie's <laughs> going, oh, honey, we don't talk about that. Right. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Switching gears. Can you remember Mm -hmm. something specific that someone said to you about being an HSP that felt hurtful or insensitive? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest one would be you're a crybaby. Mm. Um, I just remember that so well. (laughs) And I remember feeling like I don't have control right. over this. Like I'm not choosing tears right now. Like I really don't have any choice. Um, and so that was mostly as a kid, like that was mostly, I remember it as late as like, I don't know, middle school, maybe even high school. But then I remember having an experience. Um, is it okay if I go into like something that came of that Absolutely. later? Absolutely. Yeah, so I was in this um, group therapy weekend where you're both learning how to be a group therapist, but you're doing it experientially by being in intense group therapy all weekend. And I was crying at one point and I apologized. And, you know, I was talking about like deep family stuff as one does. And I apologize as I'm sorry, I'm, I'm crying. I just cry really easily. And I remember this man sitting next to me and it was particularly moving to me because it was a man. And he, he started like punching the ground next to him. And he was like, don't you ever apologize for crying. That is your heart. Mm. And it just felt like, oh, I just felt so seen and and validated. So mm-hmm. if you could go back to that time when someone called you a crybaby, what would you want to say now? I mean, if I could just be like this amazing 10-year-old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can. I think I would want to say like, oh, I do cry quite a bit. I do cry, you know, when I'm feeling sad or, you know, feeling a lot. So, Yeah. I think that's fine. But yeah, you're just noticing that I cry a lot. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Yeah. That doesn't sound like how I talked when I was 10. It doesn't have to. This is podcast (laughs) land. Right. You can have any experience you want. Yeah. What are some of your superpowers being an HSP? I would say um, being able to tune in to another person would be a big one. Being able to slow down and tune in would probably be the most meaningful one to Mm me. Um, And then also being able to use my own sensitivities to set up an environment so that that environment feels calm and feels nurturing and that there's like room for people to make themselves comfortable. I love that. Anything else? I mean, there's probably more that I'm not thinking of it, partly because I think my HSP identity feels so baked in to everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think there's anything I'm not thinking of? Oh, you you have a ton. 
you just have the most calm and gentle presence and your ability to hone in and focus. And I mean, that's kind of the tune in, I guess. Mm. But yeah, your ability to make somebody feel really like you're there with them in the moment. I'm like, oh, is that tuning in? (laughs) Oh, well, thank you. I'm really glad I asked. That feels really good. But even just the inflection in your voice is just, it's like light and present. And I don't know, you just seem so engaged when I hear you. Mm. Thank you. What would you want to tell your younger self about being an HSP? Mm. Oh, God, that would be great. I would say, girl, you are sensitive and it's totally cool. It's just how it's going to be. It's totally cool. And you're going to find other people who are sensitive too. And that's going to make you feel really fine about it and really normal about it. And you're going to marry somebody who's also really sensitive, who cries even more than you do. (laughs) (laughs) And you're not fragile. You're very strong. And it's, it's totally fine for you to cry sometimes or rest sometimes. And, you know, you can still be a badass. Love it. I'm just taking notes, so. <laughs> I'm too afraid to take notes on the computer. I'm afraid it's going to screw up the recording. Totally, because it clicked. Oh, I hadn't class. thought about that. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything about being an HSP that I didn't ask you that you want to talk about? Hmm. Something. I love being an HSP. I love HSPs. I do think there's something that we can fall into as a community which is kind of looking at sensitivity as fragility and, um, and not seeing ourselves as resilient and strong. And I think for white HSPs like me, it can fall into like thinking that we're fragile and that we like can't handle things like really tough things like talking about racism And so I think like that would be the place as a community that I would love to see us like keep pushing and being present for, for those kinds of conversations. So I think that like, there's just this edge between like really owning my sensitivity, but then also really saying like I'm strong and I want to be in difficult conversations mm-hmm. that can be like, a, um, I can't tell I'm using my hands. Like I'm just like, that's sort of this tension point, I think in the, in the bigger HSP community. Right. And I, I find too, that I have a really hard time being able to remember and distinguish between in the past when I felt very disempowered and how today I'm much more empowered, but I feel, I forget Mm. to merge those two. I think sometimes we have such strong reactions to things. And when we don't know that we're an HSP and we don't know that we're having a strong reaction, it, it's like it gets cemented or imprinted where we think that we can't handle things. But the reality is that we're handling all kinds of things today, but we just haven't changed that message. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's perfect. And like this feeling like, vulnerability is, is like too much or, you know, feeling like we're in a really difficult moment is too much where like there were times in our lives when it was too much or where we didn't have, like maybe we were being bullied or we didn't have the, you know, the resources to, to handle things in a way that felt good. And like the difference between that and being in a moment where we actually have a lot of power and we can be resilient. I feel like I, I didn't articulate it very well then, but something you said felt really no, true. No, I think you did a great job. And I really wonder how many times we have been overwhelmed and overstimulated and our nervous systems mm. just can't handle it. And then if we tend to be criers, because that's what we do, then we cry, then mm. we feel like we're in a disempowered place 
And then we don't know mm. later on that it doesn't have to be that way. Mm-hmm. It, it's yeah. interesting. I was talking with a friend about, um, she's got some HSPs in her life, and we were talking about the intersection between wounding and being an HSP and then not being able to take criticism. And so I was asking mm-hmm. my husband, like, do you feel like you can't tell me stuff because I get upset? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, and yeah. we started to talk about it. But what I had asked was, you know, do you think that that's the me from the past as opposed to the me from now? Because I think early on, in our, you know, we've been married 21 years. I didn't know I was an HSP. I hadn't done a lot of work yet. And I do get defensive, especially with my husband. And so he's kind of an easygoing guy who doesn't really like conflicts. So for him, it's not difficult for him. He would much rather not have conflict. So it's not like he's stewing in resentment. It's just like, it's just not worth it. But we were talking about, I said, I have a feeling I can probably handle a lot more than you think that I can. And I think that it's easy for relationships to get started in a pattern and then there's growth, but we don't know it because we don't challenge it for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I asked, I asked if he'd come on the show and talk about it. He wasn't sure he wanted to do that. (laughs) Ooh, that would be a good conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Right. I, I actually, that's interesting. I was just saying to my wife yesterday, like recently a few people have given me feedback and have said, I don't know if this is going to be really hard for you to hear or like, I don't know if this is going to be hurtful to you. And then have given me the feedback and I was like, that was fine. Yeah. Like, I really want more of that. And um, and then I was thinking, oh, I bet I wouldn't have been as fine before. I bet I would have like gone to like more of a fall apart place maybe in the past. And so that's pretty cool. Yeah. I really <laughs> think that somebody was asking me about vulnerability. I was being interviewed and they were asking me about vulnerability. And of course, after the podcast was over, I had a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I think vulnerability is really about courage and it's a skill that we develop and the way that we develop it is by practicing it. So when we have shame and we yeah. call out, you know, the shame that wants to stay in secrecy because we're afraid that if I tell you what my shame secret is, you're going to validate it and then I'm not going to be able to manage it. But I think every time we take a little step and we either call out the gremlins or we have a moment of vulnerability and we get through it, it builds that muscle And it gets to a point where the shame and the gremlins, we just know that it's noise and we learn to call it out. And then we become so much more comfortable and accepting because like, I know I've got this noise in my head. I kind of like you were saying, like, I'm deep, I'm intense. I have a lot of deep feelings. I have high expectations. I've got lots of disappointments. So if you tell me that, I'm going to go, (laughs) uh-huh. Yeah, Because I've looked at it and I've talked about it and had fears around it. And then it gets to a point where you can't hurt me with that stuff because I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important when people want to know how how do we build that courage? How do we build that resilience? You got to do it with safe people and you don't do it all over the place. You test it out. But I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. And then you can get to the point of like, or for me, I can get to the point of feel, feeling like feedback can be like I can I can actually just hear the feedback rather than only being able to hear the noise of like shame and oh gosh, there's something so wrong with me to actually hear what's being said and it can feel useful mm-hmm. if it's useful. You know, sometimes it's not, but so often it is, especially like at this point in my life. And knowing the people that like, I don't really want to hear their feedback because I know what type of feedback they give and that's not helpful for me. That's a very small percentage of my life right now, but also knowing that it's really okay to say, "Mm, nope, thanks. Really don't want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Annie, tell us about your projects and where people can find you. Yeah. So my, the thing that I that I do is helping therapists to create the businesses that they really want. And so sometimes that means creating a therapy practice and sometimes it means creating something really different, like an online program or a speaking career 
or you know something that they didn't expect. So people who are trained as therapists and you know a lot of those people are HSPs, which means that we need to get creative about creating the business that really is going to work for them. And my podcast is Therapist Clubhouse, although it's going to be retitled Ooh, soon. Tell. <laughs> yeah, so I actually haven't talked about this anywhere yet, but it's going to be called Rebel Therapist. Ooh. Yeah, because the people I work with are really wanting to be leaders in a bigger and different way. Yeah, and you can find me at coachingwithannie.com. Annie, thank you so much for hopping on with me today. This has been just fun and exciting and delightful. Thank you, Patricia. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Patricia. You too. So can we do the the debrief? (laughs) Hey again. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. I really enjoyed listening to it a second time as I was getting ready to release it as I'm going on this break. Thank you so much for being here, for listening. If you're interested in working with me, I've adopted a whole new model for doing coaching. I'm no longer doing therapy, so I'm working with people globally. And I found a pretty effective way of working with highly sensitive people. I'm going to be doing an episode on this as soon as I am able to articulate it a little bit more clearly. But I really thought that one of my weaknesses as a therapist or coach was not allowing the client to really figure out what was going on. And what I'm seeing is I have a real gift for getting a big snapshot of what the overview of what's going on is. And what I find in the work that I do with clients is I share what my perspective is, and it kind of lays a roadmap for us to jump in and really do some deep work. And I, I think with many highly sensitive people, We don't want to take time to figure out what's going on. If you give us the information, we do a great job with using what's going on to figure out how to make it work for us. So I found this to be really effective. If this is interesting to you, I offer a free 20-minute online consultation. You can go to unapologeticallysensitive.com. Although I'm taking a month off from releasing new episodes for podcasting, I'm still seeing clients and doing the things that I do in my day-to-day life. Remember, Sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. 